Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, setting your time to attend this yet another episode of the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing. Uh, today, we are privileged to have uh, our head of research, that is uh, Chachi Logutu, and uh, who's uh, accompanied by uh, members of his team, that is uh, Melody Danu, who is a research analyst at Genghis Capital, and Wesley Manambo, who is a uh, a junior research analyst at Genghis Capital too. Accompanying us is uh, our guest speaker, uh, or rather from our uh, partner, that is uh, FX PESA, EGM Securities, Matthew Cabere, who is going to tackle the global markets. Welcome, uh, Matthew. And uh, should you have any question, uh, you can direct it in, in the Q&A section in the control panel, in your control panel. Uh, which and the, the questions will be answered at the end of the session. And to start us off, uh, Churchill will uh, will take us through the fixed income uh, section. Over to you, Churchill. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan, and a good morning to all our participants. So I'll kick start off with the presentation on the macroeconomic and also the fixed income. And then finally, we'll discuss on the equities and also the opportunities in, within, within the two asset classes. So we'll start with the last week, uh, the macroeconomic calendar, or rather what, was, what came out last week. Uh, uh, on, at the very beginning, we'll look at the draft budget estimates that were tabled in the National Assembly. So basically, uh, these estimates are supposed to be tabled two months before the end of the financial year. So last week we saw the leader of the majority party in parliament tabling the draft uh, budget estimates to the executive. Uh, what you're seeing there, uh, put there at 1.88 trillion shillings. Uh, for the judiciary, uh, these estimates were tabled by the chief chief whip of the leader of, of the majority party in the National Assembly. Uh, that's, we don't have the visibility to those numbers, but we're looking at a figure of around 38 billion shillings. And then for the legislative, that is uh, the budget estimates to the parliament, the two houses in parliament. Uh, we're looking at uh, an estimated 18 billion, which were tabled by one member of the parliamentary uh, Parliamentary Service Commission. So in overall, uh, just based on these estimates that were tabled last week and including the what is called the Consolidated Fund Services. So what's in, included in the Consolidated Fund Services are things like uh, public debt service costs, uh, the pensions, and also some salaries to some constitutional office holders. So you are seeing that it's at around 1.3 trillion. And then we have the equitable share to re equitable revenue share to counties, 370 billion. So on the expenditure side, what we are looking at as the total budget in the next financial year is 3.6 uh, trillion shillings. That's on the aggregate. Uh, the other bit of the expenditure is now how do we finance this budget? Uh, so we are looking at uh, 2.2 uh, 2, 2 trillion shillings in terms of the total revenue split between ordinary revenue and also what's called the appropriation in aid or sh uh, short form of it is AIA. So totaling to two trillion shillings, we have grants uh, coming to 62 trillion shillings and then we have the gross financing needs, uh, which is coming to around 1.5 uh, trillion shillings. Uh, so that is the budget for the next financial year. Uh, having said that, I mean, these are still the draft budget estimates. We, we have the budget and appropriation committee to critique these numbers. Ideally, the expenditure to the national government and before now they are finalized and the finalized estimates is what will be presented to the National Assembly, uh, what usually happens when the CS for Treasury goes to parliament to present the budget. So this is part and parcel of the budget uh, process for the next financial year. So moving on to the other key data that came out last week was now the April inflation rate on a year-on-year -year basis. Overall, 
uh, sorry, it's around 5.78%, not 5.9% that I've indicated here. So that's the print that came out as at the end of, uh, for the month of April. It was slightly lower than the 5.9% that was there for the month of March. So slightly lower uh, against the expectation, but nonetheless uh, within the band. Uh, core inflation, this is basically stripping out uh, the food and fuel inflation is still subdued at 2.4%. And then the food inflation uh, came down slightly lower to 6.4% uh, from 6.7% in the prior month. Uh, fall inflation uh, uh, came off uh, marginally, uh, not marginally, uh, quite uh, uh, modestly uh, from 15.8% in the month of March to 14.8% uh, for the month of April. So ideally, no brainer here. We saw the EPRA fuel pump price review uh, retain, retaining the pump prices as they were in the previous review. But nonetheless, the outlook for, uh, for the fuel pump price review uh, that will be released uh, mid this month, I see it's more biased towards the downside, uh, looking at the average global oil prices uh, has been quite steady at 65 uh, shillings, uh, 50, 60, $65 per barrel. And the appreciation of the shilling, we've seen 1.5% uh, appreciation of the shilling on average in the month of April as compared to the month of March. So those two factors are likely biased towards uh, decline in the fuel pump price once the review uh, comes up sometime in this month. So looking at the outlook in the macroeconomic calendar, we are expecting the purchasing managers index, uh, the PMI. Ideally, this is a pulse of the private sector business sentiments uh, will be out on Wednesday. A print above 50 is showing us that there's still some expansion or rather that there's some robustness in the private sector, private sector, in the, within the private sector, we're looking at things like output. Output, uh, new ex, new orders account for 30% of that index. So you can imagine if you're a business and then you're receiving the orders. I mean, it, it also accounts to uh, positive business sentiment. There's the, um, what's called the output, uh, which accounts for 25% of this uh, PMI. Uh, then employment is 20%. Uh, so and on and so on and so forth. Uh, so those are the three key sub indices: uh, new orders at thirty percent, output at twenty five percent, and employment at twenty percent. So those are the three key sub indices that we are looking at. The prior print was at fifty point two. Has been steadily coming down, at least in the first quarter. And I think because of the with uncertainty that was prevalent in the month of April, we're likely to see it more or less within this 50.2 that was there previously. And we expect the submission of the finance bill. Actually, this was supposed to be submitted last by the end of last week uh, in line with the stipulation of the Public Finance Management Act, but that hasn't uh, panned out. So we're expecting it perhaps either today's session or tomorrow's session, at least to be within uh, the time limits that have been set in the PFM Act, Public Finance Management Act. We still also expect the 2021 economic survey. We had expected it in line with the recent trends whereby this report is usually published the last week in April, that didn't pan out last week. So we're still expecting it in the near future. Uh, we expect that this uh, report will be out. That's telling us the numbers, 2020 growth numbers, uh, employment, and also the balance of payments over the course of last year. And the long awaited um, fourth quarter unemployment rate is still, we, we still are not yet certain when it will be released. So at this point, let me jump into the fixed income, uh, a review of last week's activities in terms of the secondary market. Uh, that's the key bonds trading. Uh, we saw that uh, the turnover declined marginally by 3% week on week to an aggregate of 16.8 billion. 
And we are seeing that the trades were majorly on the infrastructure bonds, the IFBs, and specifically the 18 year infrastructure bond that was issued at the front end of last month. That's the IFB 1 2021 18. But none, that said, we expect that this trade will somehow fizzle out as we are looking at uh, the dual tranche uh, papers that are up for sale for this month. So we expect that when we revisit this numbers next week, uh, this uh, IFB 1 2021 18 most likely will not be taking the lion's share of the trading activity. Uh, getting on to the weekly tables, uh, the overall bids that were received was 30 billion. Uh, that was a performance rate of 125% in light of the 24 billion that the fiscal agent was seeking at that auction. Uh, yields still on an uptrend, and we saw that on average they have climbed by 0.64% across the tenors from the start of this year. Uh, moving on to the liquidity trends, we are seeing that uh, last week the interbank market, the average rate declined by negative 0.37% uh, to an average of 5.23%. So that was an indicative of slight improvement in liquidity uh, among the banking sector, in the, within the banking sector. And that was also cemented by the fact that the open market operations, that's OMO, uh, was biased towards liquidity mop-ups over the course of last week. So in aggregate, uh, CBK sought to mop up uh, 60 billion. They received bids totaling 51.2 billion, but then they managed to accept 38.25 billion at a weighted average rate of 6.68%. Our estimates of the net domestic borrowing as at the end of last week, inclusive of the overdraft at the CBK, it's around 402 billion uh, shillings, and that's around 75% uh, of the target that is supposed to be realized within this financial year. That's 540 billion. Moving on to uh, the week's trade, uh, this week, uh, the auction for the dual tranche bonds is on Wednesday and we expect uh, it's a reopening of uh, FXD2 2019-15 so basically this is the second 15-year paper that was issued in 2019 and also there's a new 25-year paper being issued this year so FXD1 2021-25 the target to be that is being sought by the CBK is 30 billion and is intended for budgetary support uh, these two papers by the fact that they are above 10 years are subject to a withholding tax of 10%. So that 10% will be applicable on the coupon rate. And in the event that uh, for investors whose bids are at a discount after the auctions are uh, after the auctions are out, so they will be subjected to 10% on that discount uh, portion of the of, of the price that they'll be uh, that will be Settle, that they'll have to settle with the CBK. So we're looking at uh, looking at the two papers. So on the FXD2, supposed to be FXD2 2019-15, the effective tenor is 13 years. This paper, which was issued in 2019, uh, was has its next coupon payment is next week on Monday, and that is coinciding with the value date for these two papers. So effectively, we're looking at a 13 years spot on that this paper will be for, for this paper for specifically for this paper its coupon rate is 12.734 percent uh so as at the end of last week its implied yield was at 12.67 percent so we're looking at it's being it, it's being priced at a premium uh for this particular paper just looking at the implied yield uh premium from the fact that the implied yield is lower than the coupon rate so that's where the premium is coming so for every 100,000 perhaps as an investor you have you may likely be paying north of 102 and this is even before the accrued interest kicks in uh what we are recommending uh we are recommending uh between 13 percent to 13.2 percent uh we are looking uh this has stemmed from the fact that 
when this paper was initially issued in 2019, there has been some subsequent issues. It, there was a, a reopening of this paper uh, towards the tail end of 2019, and then it was followed by a capsule. Last year also, in December, uh, around December, November, December, we saw that this paper was also reopened, and then it was similarly followed with a capsule. So the last reopening in December, the implied deal was around 12.8%. So holders of this paper right now, it, it, we are thinking that um, our thought process was that for a holder of this paper, right now, uh, because of the implied deal lower, uh, lower than uh, uh, the coupon rate, they're at a premium, but they would like, or based on the trading on this paper, so like that uh, the, we are seeing some aggressiveness in bids uh, so that even uh, the existing bondholders might be able to seek out opportunities of even uh, balancing out even in their portfolios. Hence uh, our bid, hence we are a bit aggressive in, in terms of our bidding at around 13% to 32%. Based on the fact that, let me put it this way, based on the fact that the last reopening was at 12.8%, we don't expect that there'll be investors might come in and be even lower than what was there previously. So that's why our, our, our ranging bids are slightly higher than even the coupon rate. So people will get in at a discount in this paper. So that's the bottom line of our pitch as we do our recommendations. We're looking at between 13% to 13.2%. Similarly, for the 25 year paper, this is a new paper, which has a turn of 25 years. Uh, the, the current paper that has the longest life to maturity is around 23 years. It's a 25 year paper that was issued in 2018. So we're looking at, an, it has an effectively life of, effective life of around 22 years to around 23 years. Uh, so that's it. And based on the fact that there was a 20 year paper that was issued in the month of February, this 20 year paper that was reopened, but it had an effective life of 17.4 years. And the auction or the average at that auction came in at 13.4%. So looking at 13.4%, for a 17.4 years. But here we have a new year, new paper, which is 25 years. So range of the bids or the yields will be higher than what was realized within this 17.4 year paper that was issued in February. So hence our yields are benchmarked on that 17.4 year paper. And hence our Bidding range for this 25 year paper is between 13.85 to 14.1%. But nonetheless, having said that, uh, for retail investors, so long as you have anything below 20 million, you are uh, at liberty to put in a competitive bid so that you are assured, you are assured that you'll be able to uh, receive this uh, paper at the average uh, weighted rate from that auction. So moving on to the equities, I'll start with the recapping of last week's activity. Uh, the Nairobi All Share Index increased by 2.1%, while the NEC 20 Share Index declined by 1.1%. So there's mixed uh, performance between the benchmark indices. Uh, the turnover increased by 1.7% last week uh, to 2.45 billion. Uh, top gainers from Africa, uh, which is trading on the pennies, uh, Longhorn and uh, TPS Serena are rounding off the top three gainers. Uh, top losers, we had Olympia Capital, Omeme, and also BOC Kenya now rounding up the top three laggards over the course of last week. Uh, getting on to the foreign activity, foreigners are still accounting for the lion share of the activity. Uh, we saw them at 56.2% um, of the overall turnover that was there last week uh, with a net inflows of 925 billion. And let me just mention that uh, 900 billion of this was attributed to Safaricom, uh, which had the lions, which 
played a significant part for the inflows that you saw over the course of last week. Uh, specifically for Safaricom, no brainer here. Uh, back on the heels of the the telco being qualified uh, at least to be part of the Ethiopia license bid. So no brainer there. We saw a bit of some uh, accumulation and even the counter hitting a record high of uh, 41 shillings per share over the course of last week. Uh, EABL similarly, uh, we saw some accumulation or inflows by foreigners and also equity and also turn week. Uh, we saw outflows or foreigners exiting on balance on KCB counters. Uh, top five traded counters uh, as per what we've just mentioned. So moving at where NSC, Nairobi, share, Nairobi Securities Exchange All Share Index is ranking against some of the peer comparis, competitors. Uh, on our price to earnings metric, uh, we are seeing that Kenya is slightly overvalued as compared to its peers at 12.8 multiple against an average of 10.5 multiple. Uh, the dividend yield is slightly lower than the peer average that we are looking at. Uh, Kenya is at 2.2% and uh, the African average is at 4.7%. But nonetheless, Kenya has its own attractiveness. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit liquid as compared to some of the peers that we have on the screen. And uh, that's also some of the factors that still uh, catapult investors to look at this particular market. Because uh, corporate calendar, uh, nothing much uh, coming up this week. And uh, we're seeing activity will now uh, rev up in the second week of May, 16th of May, with uh, the final dividend, the closure of uh, Bamburi Cement's final dividend of three shillings. Also next week is when the bonus share for IND uh, will be closing 10th of May. So that's something that we keep an eye on. And nonetheless, some of these uh, book closure dates are stretched all the way up until uh, end of June. So moving on to the week's trade, we're still biased towards those uh, counters. Uh, that have, can weather the storm. We are still not yet out of the COVID-19 tunnel. So we are looking at those names that could weather the storm. Uh, mm -hmm. And primarily we're looking at those counters that are quite liquid, uh, that even are attractive to the foreigners, are the names that we mentioned in the previous two slides. Uh, specifically for this week, we're looking at EABL. Uh, this is on the back of uh, the, the, the weeks, uh, the weekend's uh, President's uh, Labor Day announcement to the effect that, uh, which implicitly uh, implied that uh, the bus that had been suspended, the operation of bus that had been in suspension of the operation of bus in these five disease infest, infested counties has been lifted with that uh, line that uh, all bars in the Republic of Kenya will be operating up until 7 p.m. So I quite bullish that in this urbanite uh, five counties, at least there'll be resumption of activities. And that is a positive, that is a plus for EABL uh, going forward. Uh, right now, as at the end of last week, it closed at 167.5. Uh, the share price. Uh, so we're looking at a 14.5% upside against our target price of 194.3. It's multiple uh, price to book is, is around 9.5, uh, nine times uh, against some of its peers within the Sub-Saharan African space. So I'll stop at this point and invite uh, Matthew to work out the markets. Matthew, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and hope you had a great weekend. Let's now dive into the global markets and see what we can pick there. Sharing my screen. Okay, hope you all can see my screen. Well, um, this week we have quite a busy calendar and last week as well, um, there were quite some good news there and really moved the market, especially on Friday. So we're able to see that um, S&P 500 held a near record high because of the strong US economic data. 
it came up that um, there were robust corporate earnings as we looked at the, the calendar, the, the expected companies that were going to report their earnings, it came up and almost 85 or over 80% of the data that came up was positive. And that one fueled the rise of um, the US, the S&P 500. Um, while prices rallied, of course, we were expecting the OPEC meeting and um, the meeting came out that they were still continuing to hold on to the agreement of um, uh, balancing the production of oil against the consumption as uh, economies recover from, from COVID-19. So the agreement is to keep on gradually increasing the production in such a way that it doesn't um, get the supply doesn't uh, overwhelm the demand, which is still struggling. But all in all, uh, the optimism for recovery, it made the oil a little bit rally. Um, Fed, Fed Reserve struck a more positive tone of the US economy. As you all know, we had the COMIC meeting and um, that one gave, it was considered a little bit dovish because uh, the, the Fed still considers uh, the country to be in a level of struggle still and they until until the expected levels of um, inflation are attained they are not likely to start tapering just like um, Canada did so what happened there is still that dovish that dovish expectation that dovish sentiment from the from the feds um, but we had a positive tone because the positive data came up and um, that is that, that kept the dollar getting stronger because we had a lot of um, uh, getting strength in, in terms of the personal consumer expenditure and uh, that one was able to give an insinuation that they still recovery getting on, the economy getting better. So policymakers acknowledge the progress of vaccinations and uh, there's still the greater flow of fiscal stimulus, but still they're not likely to change the, the, their monetary policy measures to at least try and curb uh, inflationary measures coming in there. So they maintain the quantitative easing, that one still shows that there is inflation. But more importantly, traders observe what move the market is there uh, uh, the outlook of recovery for the US to, for the US economy better than those other counters from from the Japanese side, European side, Canada, and even New Zealand. That is for last week. So what are we looking up this week? Just a little bit of a, an explainer before we look at the calendar. Um, we are looking forward to look at the manufacturing and services PMIs, purchasing managers, managers index. I had uh, Churchill as well allude to that when it comes to the to what, what's really going to what we are expect, expecting this week for our economy here in Kenya, and um, we still have trade data because of key official factory data in the US. That one will be coming even before the jobs report come and. Um, that is what's really going to solid, to, to like give a summary of the outlook. Central bank monetary policy meetings in the UK, Australia, and um, Bank of Japan. Remember, all meetings are being closely watched after the Bank of Canada, because uh, Bank of Canada they decided to taper their quantitative easing measures, and that's really made the currency strengthen quite a lot a, a couple of uh, weeks ago. I think last week, part one, and. Um, that is what markets are looking forward. That's what traders are looking forward to see. And whether it's going to send their prices higher, make those, those currencies stronger or weaker uh, against others. It has COVID-19 waves still remain a concern. And uh, we're still seeing the latest PMI readings giving uh, how activity is likely to, 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 to how activity is showing some resilience of course, from the, starting from the US, we had a stronger consumption uh, expenditure, right? Personal consumption expenditure. That's what the US mostly uses to indicate uh, the level of um, inflation. And that's what they're waiting to see whether it goes above 2%. But um, this week, we're watching over to those UK, US, Australian, and Bank of Japan. 
US strong US job reports still we're disputing to see whether it's come it's still be in line with what we've seen last week, more improvements. And um the employ the employment unemployment rate is expected to go a little bit lower from 6.0 to 5.8. That would be a better uh, sentiment for even a stronger US dollar. So in Europe, UK, uh, the, um, the PMIs, of course, will be accompanied by the Bank of England Monetary Policy Meeting and still uh, want to see whether they will follow what happened with the Bank of Canada, right? And it will give a direction on the movement of that currency. So that's what we're looking forward to check out this week. And here's the economic calendar. You can see most of it is um, dominated by the purchasing managers index on European side, Canadian side, and uh, US. That is today. Okay. And then, of course, uh, unemployment rate in New Zealand and um, the statement there, right, on Tuesday. US trade balance. Of course, these are the main events. We filter out the main events to, uh, to, to you all traders so that you can see what's going to um, move these currencies. On Wednesday, we ha still have the PMIs and the US crude oil inventories is going to move or give a direction towards uh, whether we have a continuation of the rally in the US oil. On Thursday, still PMIs, but still Bank of England monetary policy will uh, given a little bit more weight in that case. Friday, of course, US jobs report. We'll see whether it will support um, what we expect. Of course, today we have a statement by um, Jerome Powell, right, still going to give to give a direction on whether the US is still going to maintain their um, dovish, dovish sentiment on the market. This is, check out on the calendar. This is, these are the main events which are there. And uh, of course, when you look at the, at the events, you're looking forward to see because there's always an expectation given on um, the data coming up. So if, if it's still an, a better expectation, uh, traders start pricing in, which means you start tra trading, uh, in comparing the previous data and what you're expecting into the market before the actual news is, is released. But um, when the news is released, if it comes out better, it means that uh, giving a strength to that currency, but always make sure you have a history of what has been happening to be able to predict the market better. Um, products to watch this week, of course, um, based on the US news that came up last week, giving it more strength. Of course, the, the dollar index has been rising, especially on Friday, it really went high. And that's what made that pullback on that um, Euro USD, because of course, you know, in, when you're trading here, it's like um, buying one currency while simultaneously, simultaneously selling one, one currency. So in this case, uh, if more traders went into the USD because of the strength that came up, of course, supported by um, the, the, the better news that came up in, term, in terms of consumption, right? That's made the traders prefer the US dollars compared to the Euro. So. It was buying the USD, selling the euro, and you can see the pullback there. So the early rise in the euro USD was supported by the rise in German bonds, okay, against the weakening of the US dollars as traders were waiting for the news that came up later in the week. So the German bonds, it's uh, their bond yields, right? That's what supported the euro. But um, the GDP contracted 0.6% QOQ. Right, quote on quarter for the last, for the um, first quarter of the year. But uh, the US expectations, strong expectations on the consumer uh, side made the US dollar stronger. All right, and then you can see the pullback. So looking at the technicals on the chart, as at the time I pulled out this chart, um, the price is still above the moving average moving averages, there you have the 200 moving average after the moving average in the 50, right? Um, we have to check out on that strong level, that resistance level that which has been holding, support level which has been holding as a resistance level previously. And the price is currently around 1.202, okay? 
and we have a strong support there at 1.2, right? So these are the technical levels to watch. The price had hit a 1.21 level last week, which was uh, the high, the, 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 the testing the high of February, right? The end of February and the beginning of March. So currently looking at the, at the, at the oscillators there, you can see the momentum is below 100, still signaling bearish. Uh, RSI below 50, signaling bearish, uh, uh, bearish, bearishness of that currency. But we have to see whether that currency is going to exit that level between 1.20 and 1.202. That's why we have um, strong support. If it have, it's, it's able to hold on to that level and um, get support to the upside, then we're likely to see the price going to test all the way the highs of Friday, it was able to beat of Friday at 1.212, if it's 2.15, 1.215, yeah. If it breaches that level, looking forward to see whether the bulls will go to test the 1.22 and then maybe to the upside. But the key levels to watch is that support level at 1.20. And um, even more importantly, I have used a Fibonacci level there. You can see currently it's just hovering just around the one the, that 8.2 and it's at the 200 moving average so break below those levels might signal a bearish move again all the way to 1.1 1.195 maybe even down once if it keeps a bearish move that is um, for the euro usd and this is on four hours time frame on our radar still this week is the US 30, the Dow Jones, US 30 roll. That's how you find it on our platform. Of course, the upbeat earnings data for various companies, and it's something we've been looking at, the consumer expectations and the ramped up vaccinations from the US kept the US 30 roll. That is the Dow Jones soaring higher. But of course, um, when these stocks, when, when the investors in the market get um, a bumper uptrend and um, an increase in uh, increase in uh, the prices of the stocks, they tend to take the profits. Okay, and that one brought about a small pullback. Okay, so still, even when the when the inflation is coming up, still uh, investors want to take up book some of their profits as a way to see where the where the the prices move. Of course. After, after key monetary, uh, monetary data, monetary policy data comes up. So the technical levels to watch, you can see it's consolidating around the 33, 33,690 and uh, 34,200, currently holding around the 3.91. So this price has not been able to break up or down for quite a couple of, um, I may say since April 15th. So uh, we want to wait and see how the, whether the, 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 the price will take, uh, will break up once beyond the 34.200 level. That's where bulls might, or buyers might want to take an opportunity, right? And um, if, it, if it fails, currently you can see it's trading above the moving averages, but still um, we want to see whether it will break below the 200 moving average. And if it breaches that 3,690 levels, we might see the price even pulling back a little bit. And looking at the oscillators there, it's like they're also holding at the 50 level for the RSI and 200 level at the momentum. So have to watch onto this and see where the price breaks and how the momentum and, uh, comes up to be for good positions. But over and above, Keep watching anything above that for 200 for bullish moves, anything below uh, that 3, 690 around there, and even below the moving averages for short positions. Still, we have earnings. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, over half of S&P 500, uh, that is US, 5, US 500 roll, their earnings, of course, is over 87% came up a bit. That's what uh, fueled the uptrend 
in the S&P 500. And this week still we have more companies reporting their Q1 earnings. And here are our picks. Of course, you can see the list there. Uh, go check out if you're trading on the stocks and you make sure you wait for the earnings to come up. Of course, it has been coming up better. If it comes up better still, it's an improvement in the sentiment and you might look for positions to at least get out with something. Um, on dividends, cash dividends, this is the expectations. These are the companies announcing their dividends here and the expectations, of course. Still just the same way, like uh, you're checking out for the earnings. If the data comes out better than we expected, then it means there is a, there is a like uh, investors have got a confidence uh, in the performance of that company and they're likely to keep on maybe reinvesting or even getting more investments. And that's what signals uh, opportunities for those companies, even if you look for other aspects uh, for you to hold positions in these companies. So that one brings me to the end of what I have today. Um, over to you, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Matthew, for the presentation and Churchill for the initial presentation. Uh, we have three questions. That is uh, one from Cliff Mayaka, who is asking, uh, Churchill, could you kindly explain the AIA and Consolidated Fund? Sure, sure. I can uh, explain it because based on this slide over here. So the AIA, that's the appropriation in aid, is uh, what is it's not revenue. Uh, from taxes or uh, investment income. So these are internally generated revenue amongst the ministries, departments, and agencies. So for instance, let's look at uh, State Department for University Education. It's one of the departments uh, under the executive. So it has, it's in charge of all the public universities in Kenya. So you find that uh, those public universities that run parallel programs. So that's also their way of generating income to finance the uh, activities rather than relying from uh, the ordinary revenue, which comes from the taxes or non-tax income. So AIA basically is uh, internally generated revenue uh, amongst the ministries, departments, and agencies. Uh, there's another question. So for the next financial year, looking at that AIA at 263 billion uh, shillings. Uh, so CFS, uh, that's the Consolidated Fund Services, that is at around 1.3 trillion. So ideally, this is what is called the fast charge in the budget. Uh, that is where the servicing of public debt lies in any given budget. Uh, servicing of public debt takes form of interest payment and also the redemptions in any given financial year. So those ones are a fast charge, meaning that if our revenues, let's take this 1.775 trillion, that we collect 500 billion. And remember this, this 1.9 trillion to the national government, there's some counties, uh, monies to go to the counties. But because CFS, Consolidated Fund Service, is a fast charge item, so this 500 billion that you collect as ordinary revenue, first we need to settle our debts, uh, service the debts, be it the interest and also the redemptions of debts. Uh, secondly, the other key thing and that the consolidated fund services is now payment of pensions. I think uh, in the next financial year, we're looking at 137 billion as pension uh, payments. So that is also part and parcel of uh, consolidated fund services. So it has to be paid out. Uh, so ideally, uh, the, the whole of the CF consolidated fund services is it's a fast charge of the budget. I hope I have explained. Yeah. Back to you, yep. Dan. Uh, thank you, Churchill. Isaac Mugoya is asking, apart from EB, EABL, what are your uh, recommendations for the week or month? Uh, thanks for the question. So ideally, 
uh, for the benefit of some of the our new investors. So Zengis runs three main portfolios. We have uh, what we call, what we've classified as the momentum portfolios, but ideally the momentum portfolios are those that trade frequently, that's EABL, uh, Safaricom, KCB, and uh, Equity Group. So that is part and parcel of uh, the momentum portfolio. And we do also have the second category of the portfolio is what we call the income portfolio. And that, and, and that portfolio comprises those uh, names that pays dividends, and we're looking at a benchmark of at, at, at least 6% of a 6% dividend yield. So basically that percentage of uh, dividends as a percentage of the price. So the dividend yield at 6%, that's the criteria. So in that portfolio, we had uh, names such as uh, uh, Cooperative, uh, Standard, Kenjen, and also KCB, uh, and ABSA, which were part and parcel of that uh, uh, portfolio at the start of this year. But nonetheless, uh, ABSA is the only name in that portfolio that was not able to pay uh, pay its full year dividend, full year 2020 dividend. ABSA had the uh, payment of 10 shillings and 50 cents uh, that was that went out at the book closures last week. So, but nonetheless, looking at historical ones, there are these names: KCB, ABSA, Stancha, Corp, and Kenjan, and want to have uh, at least an attractive dividend, dividend yield. And then the final category of our portfolios is not the value stocks. Basically those ones that we're looking, we, we, we at the start of the year had uh, outsized upside or they had a potential of at least 25% against the target price that we had at the beginning of the year. So there are three uh, counters in that portfolio. We have uh, Kenzen. We also have EABL and also we have uh, Kenare as part and parcel of those portfolios. But specifically on a weekly basis, we look at, uh, we just uh, give out one uh, recommendation for investors to look, keep an eye on. But nonetheless, it's still part and parcel. An investor can look at either of the three portfolios or they can look at those names uh, that at least can be able to weather the storm of COVID-19. Back uh, to thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Churchill. I think in continuation with that, Beryl Onyango was asking, uh, what do you think about ABSA? Is it a buy at this time? Uh, thanks, Beryl, for the question. Uh, looking at uh, the price action of, of, of ABSA, uh, currently, I think by the end of last week, it was it closed at 8 shillings and 60 cents thereabouts, which is more or less closer to its uh, 52 week low. So from that basis, uh, investors or looking at the positive sentiment or looking at the attractiveness of uh, the counter as compared to the last uh, one year or so uh, is quite, uh, it, it's offering an attractive entry level. So from that basis alone, you can, an investor can be able to take an opportunity of its current uh, entry level uh, point based on its uh, low, low price currently. That said, looking at uh, it didn't pay out a dividend, uh, it didn't pay issue a dividend for its full year earnings. So that somehow uh, led to some uh, muted uh, demand on the counter. It's uh, ROE, I think 9% is lower than the average, the banking sector at 10%. Return on equity, that's the ROE, basically looking at its return as a percentage of its equity. Uh, so it's lower than uh, the banking sector. It's a uh, price to book, basically looking at where it's trading at as a compared to the equity or the book value of ABSA. It's higher than uh, the average banking sector. So it's those two metrics are not that uh, enticing for an investor. But that said, uh, from the basis of uh, uh, the low pricing, uh, I think investor, perhaps if you had entered at, uh, say, a price higher than, this, higher than the current price, or you had entered at some point in the last one year, I think this is the best time to dollar cost average, or rather buy at this current low price so that you can be able to average your, your, your purchasing price, such that with any a shilling 
increase, you can be able to uh, start uh, clawing back uh, the clawing back gains on that counter. Thank you very much, Churchill. Festo is asking, uh, he wants to know the current market sentiment. Is it a risk on or a risk off? Oh, uh, quite hard to tell. And this is basically clouded by the fact that uh, we have uh, Safaricom, which is 62% uh, of the total market, market share. So basically from that basis alone, uh, the count or the overall market sentiment is pretty much dictated by the activity uh, in Safaricom. And we saw last week uh, that uh, announcement that came out uh, for the Ethiopia Telco license. And I know that Safaricom is expected to release its uh, full year numbers. That's next week on Health Day. So that by itself, or looking at uh, the activities around uh, the telco company, at 62% of the market cap, it tends to sway uh, the overall sentiment for the market. So I, I may not even talk about the overall market, but we can just stick to some of the names. So right now, uh, just based on that uh, concentration risk, if I put it this way, it's, uh, by, post that by Safaricom. So you find that uh, the sentiment of the overall market is dictated by uh, sentiment on Safaricom. So right now, I think it's still bullish uh, in the run up to the announcement of uh, the Ethiopia Telecom and then the full year earnings, which will be out next week. So. To put it, it's it's a risk on just based on uh, on the on, on the events on Safaricom. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Shevnik Investor is asking any opinion on the manufacturing and agricultural sector. Uh, for the manufacturing, apart from EABL, uh, we are indifferent on other names, and for agriculture. Also, apart from Capture uh, Ruati and Williamson T, which at least they've been issuing uh, the dividends, uh, we are quite indifferent from the other names. And besides, we don't actively follow the agricultural sector uh, up until this point in time, but we can be able to engage the investor uh, on the side if he's keen on pursuing the names in these uh, two sectors. Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, the last question is from Jane Gadi, who is asking, if I had to redeem my bond before its maturity, is this advisable and how much should I be charged? Okay, so it's, let me just say that uh, hypothetically, you are, you purchase a five-year bond today so five years born today so it's maturing in april rather may 3rd 2026 hypothetically may not be correctly on that date so the question is if the investor can be able to purchase or can be able to sell out at some point in time so basically that's the overarching question by the investor yes it's possible say three years down the line you can be able to purchase but now the pricing or the pricing that will want to sell it at will be determined by the implied deals on that day. So that's the issue about the implied deals. Uh, for instance, if uh, the paper is that uh, the paper has a coupon of 10%, and then if you sell it at a yield of 10%, you will sell it at a uh, hundred. For every 100,000, you'll sell it at 100,000. But in the event that the yields are lower than the coupon, for instance, that yield at the point you want to sell it, you say hypothetically again, 9%, you'll be selling it at a premium. And uh, that was also the focus of the bond valuation primer that we had uh, two weeks ago. So for, say hypothetically for every 100,000, that you would like to sell, perhaps you'll be selling it at 105,000. I don't know, but it will be at a premium. But if the yield is higher than the coupon at that point of sale, the pricing will be at a discount. So for every 100,000 that you would like to sell it at, 
you'll be selling it at say 98,000. So that you first and foremost, you are able to sell it, but now the price will be dictated at that point that you'd like to sell it. So it's advisable to sell it, but the price will be uh, dictated at that point itself. So, but bottom line, it will not be for your advantage if you sell it when you're the rising, because you're looking at selling it at a chances that you'll be selling it at a discount. But nonetheless, there's that issue of accrued interest uh, that kicks in. Accrued interest is also that portion of an earned coupon that a holder of a bond is entitled to. So even if you sell it at a discount, say at 98,000, but you your last coupon payments was say four months ago, but coupons are paid every six months ago. So you have like two thirds of the coupon that is entitled to you that you'll now be paid by the person whom you're selling the bonds to. So there are different dynamics uh, that comes at play. We go after it as comprehensively as I can. I, I think for for those who may want more information about, maybe Churchill can uh, mute. For those who may want more information about bond valuation, they can check out our YouTube page, which we have shared up on the chat section, and check out the webinar about bond valuation that happened uh, last month, so that they can get to understand more. Matthew, there's a question for you. Uh, Elvis Ayara is asking, is trading gold bearish or bullish? Okay, uh, Elvis, I think let me share my chat to be to give you information on the chart. So you can see my chart, look a little bit clouded. Don't mind, it's uh, where I'm checking out on the technical level. So whether it's whether it's bearish or bullish, currently I'll tell you it's bullish based on what we are um, seeing on the market. But um, um, the technical indicators, check out on the RSI there, it's um, above 50 and it's on four hours. So signaling a little bit turning bullish on the momentum, it's still below 100. That's what I look at. If it's below 100, it's it's some bearishness, but above 100, it's bullish. So for now, I think it's just waiting to see whether the momentum will just turn above 100 and it will signal um, strengthening of, uh, of the market turning a little bit bullish. But checking on the charts it's uh, themselves there, you can see the gold was able to get, uh, we've been on a bullish channel all the way from uh, March, March 29th, right? And um, once the price hit uh, on 21st around there, price got in starting up, started getting, uh, getting a pullback, got a down one channel, then a very nice support at 1760. So between 1760 and 1765, it's a strong support level there, which had previously been a resistance level, if you can check out. Uh, price above the 200 moving average, right? Still, it has struggled around the 50 moving average there. And um, you can see it's getting off this support level, has broken that consolidation. So I can see, um, for me, I'm waiting to check out whether the price will break above that. It's a small downtrend there. After that, that channel, it's a small downtrend, right? More of um, this, Again, sorry, sorry about that. Let me draw. Yeah, that down one channel. But uh, if it breaks above that horizontal downtrend at the levels above 17, 1790, we might see it trend up once to the psychological level of 1800. And if it's able to break above that level, above 1800, then might be um, an opportunity for even getting in for a higher. Uh, movement. So currently, I think it's trying to pull up some bullish uh, kind of a trend, but we have to wait up until those levels are breached for better uh, entry levels. So that one is supported by the likely, um, the likely, uh, 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 likely, what do we call it? The, the, the heating up of the US economy and the likely expected um, inflation in the US economy. Remember the government is waiting up until their levels have been reached for them to start controlling uh, the inflation using the interest rates. So currently 
the gold prices are supported by the the dovish sentiment in from the US side. So I can say a little bit bullish, but check out the typical levels for the US dollar for, for the yeah for the gold. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for the for this question. We would also uh, like to thank, uh, most importantly, the participants uh, of this webinar. You've set out your time, come listen to our speakers, and they've shared with you the knowledge. So should you want to execute uh, uh, the trades, you, may, you can do so via your mobile phone. That is via our application called Jikuze. If you have not registered, you can do so by just searching uh, the word G hyphen Kuze on your on the Google App Store or uh, the Apple Store and download. Uh, once your account has been activated, you are good to go. And uh, I see, yeah, then uh, there being no more questions, I'd like maybe to finally thank uh, Churchill, Matthew, Wesley, and Melody for the support uh, and the presentation and the presentations today. And I think that's it from uh, us. So let's meet again next week.